Okay, question twenty not sorry. Ugh. Question nine in the two thousand and eighteen chemistry exam. Now this one, just by looking at it, you can see has a lot of information. Um, and I'm not going to read all that information. I can see the fact that it's about a um, experiment. And it looks like they're calibrating a calorimeter. Um, but let's just go straight into the questions and then come back to work out what I actually need to look at because that's a much quicker way of doing questions. Um, first of all, the dependent variable in this investigation is the calibration factor. Identify the independent error variable from the student A's aim. So let's have a look here. Let's have a look at student A. Um, and down the bottom here, you can see, here it is, the aim. To compare the calibration factors obtained from two different methods, the calibration factors were found by recording the temperature change of a solution resulting in the addition of um, a measured electrical input and from the potassium nitrate dissolving in water. So what we're looking at is obtained from two different methods. So we're changing the method of calibration. So therefore, what is the independent variable? It is the method of calibration. Alrighty, one, um, let's have a look. What are they doing? Calibrations by um, electrical input and the other one from potassium, so chemical input. So looking at um, obviously inputting energy for the calibration by um, electricity or by chemical reactions. And let's have a look at the next one. Identify one systematic error that applies only to the electrical method of calibration. So let's have a look at the methods now. So what are the methods that they're taking here? So the electrical method of calibration, this is another thing, you should understand what most of these experiments are in exams. In exams, they're basically looking at um, classic experiments that you should have looked at over your time um, at school. So this is a calibration of a calorimeter. Um, so we should have an understanding of how this works. So you add the um, water to it, you stir it for a while, add some voltage for three minutes, stir it again, record the voltage and then turn the power off. So what's a systematic error that can happen here? Well, perhaps we're not stirring properly. Um, that would be a systematic error. That would be constantly the same as we go along. Um, more likely, a systematic error will involve the equipment that you're using. So I would say in section two, you would say the voltage applied is not actually six volts. The power supply might be a bit faulty. That only applies for the electrical method as well. It doesn't apply for the chemical method. The inaccurate stirring would apply for both of them. This question from memory, yep, says only to the electrical. So what we can say is we have a um, broken power supply, supply, um, which provides a lower voltage than the one recorded. All right, and that would be systematic, and that would be systematic because it will apply to every single trial that you do. Um, it's not random, it's gonna happen all the time, and it's gonna be um, factored into all your calculations, not just one random calculation for an outlier. So that would be a reasonable response for that one. But C, identify one limitation of the chemical method of calibration as given in that, um, explain how it could affect the reliability of results. Now reliability, the way I teach reliability is it's about, you can only know if your results are reliable if you obtain similar results over and over again. So let's see if they've repeated the experiment. So chemical method, there's no repetition here. So that suggests that that's what they're talking about there. Reliability is about repetition. So therefore, the student did not repeat the experiment or the calibration, I'll say experiment, I meant, and to um, obtain similar results. Um, this would decrease decrease the reliability of the results because I need to comment explain how it would affect it so I don't need to exp I need to say if it was a, a good reliability or a low reliability 
um, and every time you're looking at reliability you should be looking to see have they repeated their experiment and looked for similar results. If they repeat the experiment and get completely different results clearly you can say that the method is not reliable but at this stage we don't know if it's reliable or not um, so we need to obtain similar results um, so we know what's going on there. Part D. Where's part D? That's not there. Part D. Um, here's some graphs and the actual question is over here. Identify one difference in the results between the students graphs and suggest what variation in the student experiment might account for the difference. So here are our two graphs. Try and get them both in the picture here. Um, there we go. And what can we see? The fact that we have a broken thing, that's fine. Um, at 400, 400, this one goes up more. So I'd say that this one goes up to 25 degrees Celsius after 400, whereas this one only sits at 24. So therefore, that's a difference. Um, the, the top temperature is different, and the top temperature is reached later in the experiment. So let's go with that. So um, the top um, temperature is um, higher for graph, which one? For graph A and is reached um, after 400 and, was it? About 450, 450 seconds. Um, and this, what's a reason for that? Well, clearly, if this is reached at the top temperature at 400 seconds, this is at 450 seconds, perhaps the time is not the same. So this um, could be due to student A running the current for a longer period of time. Alrighty, so that suggests um, probably what's happened there. Um, yeah, you can clearly see that it goes along and yeah, these guys probably turned off their experiment here, whereas these guys turned off their experiment here because that's when it starts to cool down. And you'll say that it starts to cool down when the electrical current is turned off or pretty much straight afterwards. So that's that question. Let's go to the next one. Student B's data for the chemical calibrations below. This is it here. Use this data to calculate the calibration factor for the chemical method. So what we need to do, we need to know um, that is our calibration factor is going to be energy divided by temperature change, delta T. So therefore, I need to know my temperature change first of all. And let's have a look at this. So we've got 22 and that's 23.5. This is going to be 23.6, we'll call it. 23.6. So therefore, the difference is whatever our energy is divided by 23.6 take away 22 is 1.6. I should be able to do that in my head. 1.6 degrees. Where's my energy coming from? My energy is coming from dissolving my potassium nitrate. So I need to know my delta H is there. So that suggests that my number of moles of potassium nitrate, let's look at our method. How much potassium nitrate did I use? 3.0 grams. So it's gonna be equals number of moles over molar mass equals 3.0 grams divided by my molar mass of that. My molar mass of potassium is about 40.1, molar mass of nitrogen is 14, and molar mass of three oxygens is 48. So therefore, get my trusty calculator out, uh, clear, clear, 40.1 plus 14 plus 48 is 102. That doesn't sound right. I reckon it's, I reckon that's not 40. That's potassium, that's, let me have a look at my, that's 39, that's why, 39. Alrighty, so 39 plus 14 plus 48 is 101. That sounds a bit better. 
Alrighty, so 3.0 divided by 101 gives me 0.0297 mole of potassium nitrate. Then my energy is going to be equal to the number of moles times delta H. Um, so therefore that's going to be 0.0297 times my delta H, which is 35. So that's going to be times by 35. That's going to be 1.0396 kilojoules. I need it in joules, so therefore I'm going to change that into joules, which is 1039.6 joules. So therefore my calibration factor here will be that divided by that. So therefore that times 1000 to get it into joules as I did here, divide that by 1.6 gives me 649.75 joules per degree Celsius. Sig figs means I need to factor that in. My delta H had two significant figures, so let's just factor that up to 650 joules per degree Celsius. And that should be it. With calculations, remember to write down everything you possibly can. Um, all equations, what you're finding out, um, and then do it all in your calculator afterwards.